Okay, so thank you. When receiving the invitation to discuss something here was somewhat uncertain what to bring up, but I thought of telling something from astrophysics and not in a specialized manner, something that hopefully should be understandable and interesting also for non-astronomers. And this is about spectroscopy. And of course, spectroscopy is the most important part of astrophysics. And one important part of, of the objects that, that are being studied, of course, are stars. So I will try to put out a number of, of examples and follow the timeline from the historical beginnings of how one was studying stars and what is what was done in the past, how things have developed and what is happening today and what are the challenges are still not being solved. So where would you start? Well, let's start going to southern Bavaria. Let's go to the Alps and the monastery of Benedict Boyer. It's a nice place you can visit as a tourist and besides the monastery as such and one part of the monastery is the glassworks, the glassworks of Josef von Fraunhofer. This is the place south of Munich, halfway between Munich and the High Alps, where Josef von Fraunhofer was developing glass technologies in the early 19th century. Josef von Fraunhofer, well, was active. He was in, in that place. He was also engaged with the royal court of Munich at the time in Bavaria. And uh, he unfortunately died quite young. But in during his career, he developed a lot of optical techniques. And here in a painting, he is, you see him again, his characteristic, well, well a hair, hairdo, demonstrating, displaying a spectroscope. What he did mainly work was not in astronomy as such, it was in optics. And he developed precision instruments for the time, mainly prism spectroscopes, such as this one, made out of brass with some eyepiece, you could look at something, uh, disperse light in a, in a prism. And by increasingly having increased precision in the prisms, he could resolve quite a number of spectral lines in the sun. He was not the first one to identify spectral lines in the sun. That had been done earlier by, by a few other people, but he did this with very high precision. And here, this is illustrated in some postage stamps from Germany from quite some years ago. And he denoted the, the absorption lines of the solar spectrum with various letters, many of which still be, are being used, such as, for example, the D line in the yellow line from, from the sodium. But his interest was not studying the sun, really. He was using the solar spectral lines as fiducial marks, as one would today maybe use the, uh, I don't know, the, the uh, laser frequency comb, I mean, for wavelength calibration. He used the spectral lines to calibrate his optical uh, elements. The application of using spectral lines to study astronomical sources came later, not much later, a few decades later. And that involved to a large part of these two gentlemen, Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen. And they combined work in the laboratory with various, uh, I mean, spectrometers and the laboratory sources to identify that there were specific elements that gave specific absorption line or emission lines. They were working in Heidelberg in southern Germany. And if you go to Heidelberg today, you can go on the uh, pedestrian street in central Heidelberg and Hauptstraße, and there you will find a monument to uh, Robert Bunsen. And there will be fine plaques on the buildings that this is where Kirchhoff and Bunsen were working together. So what made it possible for them to realize that they could apply spectroscopy to studying distant sources? Well, the story may be true, possibly true, was that they got the inspiration from a disaster. Heidelberg is not very far from the city of Mannheim. I don't know how much, 10 kilometers perhaps, I mean, you can see it in the distance. And there was a big fire. The city of Mannheim was on fire. And they apparently turned their spectroscope towards the city on the horizon and identified that there were, a, there were spectral lines seen in the burning fires, in the light from the burning fires of Mannheim. 
and they concluded that okay if we can identify something of the chemistry in the burning neighboring city of 10 kilometer distance we should be able to do so also at million kilometer distance in astronomical sources and somewhere there the work started with identifying and say interpreting spectral lines in astronomical sources uh, first of course with the sun but, but uh, then eventually also with, with other other uh, other stars the instrumentation was then improved you can say i mean one would have not only one prism but have a sequence of prisms to increase the dispersion increase the resolution which was now possible uh, with uh, with high pre higher precision optics and this takes us to the 18 1860s or or the middle of the 19th century so this is what happened in the laboratory at the same time in the mid 19th century, a number of new observatories were built all around the world and of course mainly then in Europe, which was then in, in the center of happenings. In nearby we have in Tartu, then Dortmund Observatory built in 1825, which you can visit today. Maybe many of you have visited already. It was a very nice museum now in, in Tartu. And this epoch, basically also defines the beginning of uh, of what you call stellar stellar spectroscopy um, uh, and and this was of course not only in Tartu but also in various other places including in my native town of Lund where there was a new observatory built in 1867 and this is how it looked at that time uh, the design was quite similar for those uh, years I mean you would have a central a dome, a cupola with a larger telescope, typically a refractor. There were other buildings for astrometric um, instrumentation, meridian circles, and such. To take now Lund as an example, it also obtained a 25 centimeter refractor, the same size as in Tartu, but this was later. Tartu was several uh, decades earlier. But that instrument, such an instrument, was sufficient to start looking at stellar spectrum. And this work, taking now Lund as an example, was carried out, was leading the work at that time, was by Niels Christopher Duner. Duner was active in 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. And he used this refractor that we just saw in a previous image to, to study spectrum. He published a work in publications such as this. So this is from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, Kongliga Svenska Vetenskapsakademin, and this is in French, Sur les étoiles aspects de la troisième classe, about stars with the spectra of the third class by Niels Duner, in this case published in, uh, in uh, 1885. So what are stars of the third class? Well, they look, they have spectra like this. This is a classification which is not used anymore, which at that time was introduced by Italian astronomer of Secchi. And today we call the red giant stars or carbon stars. It is actually a class of stars that has been studied extensively in modern times in Latvia at the Baldoni Observatory as red giants, such as here is a spectrum of, of Alpha Orionis, Betelgeuse, here is another, another star. Uh, and, and some of these are carbon stars, uh, that means they have a lot of absorption bands, uh, molecular absorption bands. So these are spectra where this is wavelength going from left to right, and then this is the, the brightness uh, of, uh, of the spectrum and the absorption lines. Now these images, they look like photographs, but they are not. Because at this time you could not take photographic spectra of stars. Photography was invented, yes, of course, but it was the sensitivity of photographic plates at this time was much too low to record stellar spectrum. So these are paintings, these are drawings by charcoal, the way an artist would paint with, with a charcoal on, on a on a I mean to make sketches. So these are these are uh, subjective drawings made at the eyepiece by the astronomer or maybe from memory how he uh, experienced things. So this also raises the question how would you discuss these observations? This is for the same publication by uh, Niels Duner and he dis 
And this is how he discusses observations of various stars. So this is a star with a certain catalog number uh, at 6.5 uh, magnitude of coordinates. And then he quotes other astronomers, such as the Italian astronomer of Secchi. And he quotes Magnifio Getto nel cercatore un punto rosso assoluto, spectra fatto stradario. Do you understand Italian? Doesn't matter. It's not the language. I mean, it, you, you can feel the emotion. I mean, this is like an opera. You go to an Italian opera, you don't understand the text, but, but you have the feeling. And here he quotes the German astronomer Vogel, sehr schöner Spektrum bei den besonderen, die Banden im weniger breitbaren Teile vorzüglich ausgeprägt sind. So he describes, I mean, how very nice spectrum, you can resolve the molecular bands. And then he adds his own comments in French, les bandes principales sont très fortement marquées, mais les bandes, etc. And then there's American astronomer Pickering, very red magnitude. So what we can see here is that the various astronomers have subjective impressions of what they saw through the eyepiece. And they've been quoted in the languages of their respective publications. So apparently in the late 19th century, one was supposed to be able to discuss things in Italian, German, French, whatever language would be appearing. So that was the epoch when stellar spectroscopy was born. And here are quotes by Sam Langley. Langley who was uh, not only a physics person, also an aviation pioneer. There is a NASA research center named for him today. He wrote in the 1880s that within a few years, a new branch of astronomy has arisen, which studies the sun, moon, and stars of what they are then themselves. This new branch of inquiry is sometimes called celestial physics, sometimes solar physics, and sometimes is the new astronomy. And this influenced, of course, astronomy. A new journal was founded, the Astrophysical Journal. This is the number one, volume one, page one of 1895. And the first paper is by Albert Michelson. You know the name of Michelson from Michelson Interferometer. And the subtitle of this journal was a review of spectroscopy and astronomical physics. And this subtitle was kept by at J, the journal, until 1960s. And somewhere here, the high resolution spectroscopy era began. In the 19th century, telescopes had been built close to university towns in Europe, but in the 1900s, astronomical telescopes start to be put at mountain observatories. And the most famous from that epoch was the Mount Wilson Observatory, close to Los Angeles, about Pasadena in Southern uh, California. The largest telescope there was the 100 inch, 2.5 meter one, which was, here's some images from its erection in the 1910s, 1917, was put up on the mountain and is known as the Hooker telescope, which is still available today, however, mainly for amateur observing, but still is operational. Here is, um, its completion among details here is a chair, observer chair, which could be lifted um, in a small elevator for the observer to view. That is a chair used by Edwin Hubble during many of the pioneering works he did with this uh, telescope. But for spectroscopy, the significance was that this telescope, it had a mirror system, light coming in, bouncing back here and forth, and going down to a spectrographic room that was large and say below the level, below the floor of the telescope. And in this spectrometer room, the so-called Coudé room, one could set up large photographic cameras and record stellar spectra. By this time, the sensitivity of photography was sufficient so that you could actually record stellar spectra with at least for the brighter stars. So these are spectra, spectrograms for a number of stars uh, uh, where these are negative. So what is dark is an absorption line. Here you have at the bottom a sp star with a sequence of the Balmer lines of hydrogen. Here is a star of uh, solar type with many more uh, absorption lines and so on. So this changed astronomy. But the main change, I think, was not that the sensitivity was improved. The main change probably was sociological. Before this time, the only ones having access to solar spectra were the individual astronomers who viewed 
the spectrum through with their own eye through the telescope. It was the privilege of a very few people who had the telescopes or had access to the telescopes. Now it was possible to record the spectrum, bring them to the office and work during daytime. And the work could be done by many people, not only the ones who had the telescopes, but be discussed and, and, uh, and, and basically having a much broader audience. Somewhere in this epoch, also things came up how to measure the precise wavelengths of spectral lines and also how their displacements could be. So today we call it the Doppler effect, but who invented the Doppler effect? Was it Christian Doppler who published here Über die farbige Licht der Doppelsterne over the colored light of double stars, published in Prague in 1842? Well, sort of, but only sort of, because what Doppler, what Christian Doppler was studying actually were the sound waves, were acoustic waves. And the effect was confirmed a few years after this publication yeah, by, by musicians who were riding a train in Utrecht in the Netherlands, going into the train station and leaving the train station and blowing in trumpets and so having musicians listening to with very acute uh, there is some extra microphone turned on uh, there's an echo coming i will correct it could please yes um, and this way the 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 uh, effect was confirmed but Doppler, Christian Doppler never really understood the effect in the way we understand it. The one who understood it was Hippolyte Fizeau. And actually in many countries, in many French speaking countries of the world, the effect is called l'effet Doppler Fizeau, the Doppler Fizeau effect. And using the word Doppler effect only for the acoustic, the sound wave effect, but Doppler Fizeau for light of, of optical light, because Fizeau, while well, Doppler suggested that the color of a star could change from red to blue because of the motion, Fizeau understood there would be displacements of spectral line wavelengths inside the, the optical spectrum. And this is a realization he made some years later, not many years later, 1848 is, is uh, suggested here as a specific time. So this is what was so predicted and what could be measured. We go back to end of 19th century, the era of big refractors being built here in Potsdam outside Berlin at the Astrophysical Observatory, an institute also interesting for its name. It was the first institute, the first astronomical institute in the world who had the word astrophysical in its name. That is not astronomical, but astrophysical observatory. And they started, they, they made the first measurements of Doppler shifts of displacements of wavelengths in stellar spectra. Of course, at this time, uh, only the very brightest stars here is a spectrum of Sirius, Procyon, Rigel, Arcturus, but where you can see they have these absorption lines and the stars are slightly displaced relative to the, to the mark here, which comes from a laboratory source. This is from uh, late 19th century. So what can you use the radial velocities for? Well, you can look at the sky, you go at night, look at the sky and wonder, people have wondered which stars may have planets around them. Are we the only ones or are there many other planets out there? Now, that question has been with us, was with us for a very long time. And it was formulated maybe clearly by Otto Struve in the early 1950s. Otto Struve was one of many Struves. It was a family of very many astronomers. A Baltic German family where the great grandfather of this Otto Struve was uh, the Tartu, the Dorpat Observatory director. His grandfather was active in Pulkovo and so on. This Otto Struve was born in Kharkiv in Ukraine, but after World War I, he and he left for United States and he is at this time he was director of the Yerkes Observatory in Chicago. 
At this time, 1950, a catalog of radial velocities had been completed, and some people thought maybe that's it, there is no need to go, go on further. But he pointed out that one of the burning questions of astronomy deals with the frequency of planet-like bodies in the galaxy, which belong to stars other than the sun. So what was he aiming at? Well, it's about motion about the central mass. Let's go up to the sports stadium and look what a hammer thrower does. Well, he is moving and he is trying to throw a hammer and he's moving and he's moving around the central mass of himself and the object that he is moving around him. Now, suppose we cannot observe him very well. We see him only here like through a fog. What could we tell? Well, you could tell what is the, okay, we replay this again. You can tell that he's moving with a certain frequency. It takes a certain time for him to move around. You can tell how much he's moving away from the center area because he must remain within sort of the motion must be around the central mass. Otherwise he would lose balance and, and fall down. So even if you cannot see this uh, heavy thing that he is uh, throwing, only by looking at himself, you can tell something about how much is he moving, how rapidly is he moving, and what period is he moving. And that basically is Kepler's laws in a planetary motion that you, uh, you need to in order to interpret, I mean, how massive this other moving body is, you need to know how massive is this uh, hammer thrower or how massive is the central star. But this you can tell by other means, either you know the star from studying its physical properties or you can estimate it to the hammer thrower we know. Well, we estimate how heavy can he be? Maybe 80 kilograms, 90 kilograms. It's certainly that order of magnitude. It's not a thousand kilograms, it's not 10 kilograms. And this is what you would need to do to find the uh, find the uh, existence of uh, of a body around a star. So you basically the the star is what you can measure. The planet itself is too faint to be seen. You only get light from the star, but the star will make a slight displacement in its spectrum, the Doppler effect. It will be moving back and forth. So that is the principle for finding exoplanets. And this was known since a long time ago. Uh, and so that, uh, that in itself was not a mystery, but the problem was that you need the ethics are extremely tiny and extremely high precision is required. And this went on for many years, several decades since the 1950s, say initiation by, by Otto Struve. And the final, final results, success came in this place, a small village in the south of France, saint michel Observatoire. It's a bilingual a street sign. The bottom one is in Provençal, the top one, of course, in French. And the village is unusual also because in its name, it contains observatory. It's Saint Michel of the Observatory. And so what is this place? This is the village next to Observatoire de Haute Provence, the High Provence Observatory in southern France, maybe 100 kilometers or so north of Marseille, close to Alpes Maritimes, close to where the Alps are going down to the Mediterranean. This is where the first discovery of an extrasolar planet was made. And why am I showing, why am I showing this image? It's like a touristic image. Well, this is unusual from today's, say, astronomical environments. Today, one would maybe expect the discoveries to be made from some exotic desert locations, maybe from space. But this is the, these are the lush greens fields of, of Provence. This is a place what you associate normally with, I mean, rosé wine and, and good food and, and lavender fields. Why from here? But there was a reason. And the reason is that this is within driving distance from Geneva. And in Geneva was where the astronomers were working and developing instrumentation. And the instrumentation had to be pushed to its very limits. It did not work, it had to be refined, did not work, had to be repaired, did not work, had to be further corrected. And so finally in 1995, 
led by these people, by Michel Mayor and by his then PhD student, his then doctoral student, uh, Didier Quilos, they identified the periodic variations in the star of 51 and Pegasus, identifying the first planet around a solar-like star. And some 25 years later, they got an invitation to come to Stockholm and uh, and yes, uh, they succeeded in getting the prize, uh, uh, the Nobel, before the pandemic uh, pandemic struck. So that was the pioneering discovery of a massive, massive planet around a solar type star. But what about solar, like Earth-like planets and the sun? If we could look at the sun from a distance, how would the solar radial velocity change if we look from far away? This is the radial velocity, that is the motion of the sun around the common central mass with its planets. This is scale is meters per second, so this is 10 meters per second. 10 meters per second is the speed of a high of a of a well athletic runner. These are the years, and you see a modulation of the apparent solar velocity. And the period here is roughly 12 years. And that is, that is the period of Jupiter. Jupiter moving around the sun is inducing a motion of the sun that is reflex motion of this period. But superposed on this are other periodicities from Saturn, the longer period of Saturn, and of course, all the variations for other planets. But what would be the signature of an Earth twin? or the Earth itself. This is the simulated signal from a Earth-like planet, planet mass, one Earth mass, orbital period roughly one year, a star roughly like the sun. And we expect something that is only a fraction of one meter per second is the variation over time. So the question is, can you find this? Can you identify such a signal? Well, the answer is yes, in principle. If we have very precise wavelength calibration, such as from a laser uh, frequency comb that is done here, superposed in the solar spectrum, here is the solar sodium one line, sodium D line, which is the absorption line here. These are wavelengths in Ångström, and here is the laser frequency comb that is, this can calibrate with sufficient uh, precision. So is this sufficient to find an Earth-like planet? The answer is no. The limitation no longer is in the, in the uh, measurement precision. The limitation is in the sun itself. If the sun were shining like a frequency comb, it would be fine. But the sun is not a frequency comb. The sun is a boiling irregular cloud of gas where the radial velocity, the apparent velocity shift of the sun changes with a few meters per second over time and it follows the solar activity cycle and other uh, variations. Sun is oscillating, bubbling, and it changes by, by amounts that are much greater than those induced by a small planet. The main driver seems to be magnetically influenced areas, magnetically influenced granulation on the sun. So how can one tackle this? And this is now something that is being studied by, by many. One way is to study the sun itself. We're going back to what Fraunhofer did once upon a time. So around a few telescopes in the world, for example, here on La Palma, the island that was suffering under volcanic eruption just a few months ago, is one of the big telescopes that has inside it a very high precision spectrometer. But outside this dome, there is now a small solar telescope. It's a telescope that is integrating the light from the whole solar disk. Actually, it's surprisingly difficult to, to get the light uniformly from a solar disk. And during the daytime, every five minutes, there is a new spectrum recorded of the sun using the same spectrometer that at nighttime is searching for other planets. And the result looks something like this. This is from 2016 down up to basically now even the COVID closed down. And you can see that the solar 
radio velocity is jittering, is going back and forth. This is now five meters per second between these uh, marks. So a few meters per second, the sun is jittering all the time. It's shaking in its radio velocity. And the challenge is then to understand what is causing this jittering and how can we calibrate it away so that one could identify the presence of, of something like this Earth-like planet. The techniques one has is, for example, to use study the solar surface. Here is another telescope on La Palma, on the Rocco Los Muchachos, the Swedish solar telescope, which is in this tower. There's a small opening, a one meter opening uh, lens, and then the light goes down into the uh, tower. And with this, you can, for example, make movies of the solar surface. This is an actual movie. You see how I mean, the solar surface is slowly changing. You see some bright magnetic elements and you see a large number of convective features. These are gases that are rising, that are bright and hot, and then the cooling off and the gases are sinking down dark and, and, uh, and cool. If you put a spectrometer slit across this granulation, these structures, you put a spectrometer slit, you get them the spectrum from each element on the sun. Sometimes the slit permits light from a bright element, and then you will typically see the spectral lines. These are spectral lines wavelength increasing to the right. Sometimes you see the spectral line is bouncing one side, it's blue shifted. Typically where something is rising, coming up toward you, something that is brighter. Sometimes things are dark and sinking and then the line is locally red shifted. So the line becomes a very zigzag, a zigzag pattern. And that is encoding, of course, the dynamics of the solar surface. And when averaging over this, the average is not zero because there is nonlinear averaging. Actually, sometimes you can see lines that are not shifted at all. Why not? Well, these lines don't, don't originate in the sun. They are inside the Earth's atmosphere. These are telluric absorption lines that occur because of, of uh, well, water, vapor, or whatever else in the Earth's atmosphere. One can do this also some theoretical simulations. You get a spectral line spaghetti. You can simulate this and then this averages out to some spectral line average, which then can be somehow modeled or interpreted. And it has become possible to model stellar surfaces. For example, here to the left in the blue on the same scale as that to the right, all the simulated surfaces of a hot star to the left, 6,500 Kelvin effective temperature, to the right in the red, a cooler star, 4,000 Kelvin temperature. And if you have higher temperature, the convection that is carrying the heat must be more vigorous. Things must be go faster in order to carry one solar uh, constant outward. Recently, it has become possible to make synthetic spectra from these models. That is means you throw in all the, all the basically all the spectral lines that you know from databases. Here it is typically half a million spectral lines that have entered into the model and you compute synthetic spectra. Here, for example, this is for a cooler star, 4,000 Kelvin. This is from the ultraviolet to the infrared. You have something that looks like the Planck curve and this 4,000 Kelvin. Here you have a hotter star, almost 7,000 Kelvin, where the Planck curve is shifted to a shorter wavelengths. You see a superposed huge number of spectral lines. Also, you see some bumps. Here is a bump that originates for the negative hydrogen ion that actually is a source of opacity and so on. What is of significance is that this can be done with a very high spectral resolving power. These spectra are sampled with a wavelength resolution, delta lambda, delta wavelength step, more than one million. And the total number of data points in these spectra is on the order of three million spectral points. And that is not only, that is for each spectrum that has been computed, but the spectra are computed not only for the star as a whole, they are computed for different parts of the star. I mean, at the center of the disk, halfway to the limb, and further on to the limb. And the spectra there are different. And not only are they different uh, for position, but this, temp this simulation goes over time. So in each time step in the simulation, there's a slightly different, statistically different, well, a spectrum that is real, that is coming out. And that means that 
what used to be a century ago, a very data poor situation, very little data. Now we are facing that we each of these synthetic spectra has more than a, maybe 3 million data points, each of maybe for each maybe 20 positions on the store, and each of maybe 20 time steps in the simulation. So each one's stellar model is then represented by more than a billion data points. And how to study these, how to verify these? Well, one way is to use, again, exoplanets to study the star. We have the transit of an exoplanet across the star, so a disk. We can compare the signal from when there is no exoplanet. And this gives us some information about what is behind the exoplanet at each step during its transit. And all these things are then studied with telescopes such as those of European Southern Observatory in Chile, from where also now Bernard Fueng will be giving a talk uh, later today. Here is an aerial view over the Atacama Desert, where here in the foreground we have the Paranal Mountain with four domes of the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. Here are some service buildings belonging to it, some smaller telescopes on this side. And from 20 kilometers away, here is where the extremely large telescope is being built, the biggest so far in, attempted in the world, uh, currently under construction, hopefully to be completed by the end of this decade. And here we have new instruments such as Espresso that can be fed by light from all of the four unit telescopes of the VLT, their large telescope. Their light is then going to uh, central station here, coming in through the holes in the walls of the lab and going through these four entrances and then being fed to the spectrometer. And this is the instrument that is currently being used to search for small mass exoplanets, of course, with the ultimate aim to finding a twin to our Earth. Is there another Earth out there? And if so, can we find it and can we study it? So that is an outstanding challenge, but the difficulty today is not in the precision of instruments. This has been achieved. The difficulty now is understanding how the spectrum is formed in, in stars and how we can actually interpret that and separate it from the signals from exoplanets. So thank you for listening.